Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, when I came in there, I, f I felt like I was about to attend a burnt supper and there's really, really been a piper in front of us. Um, but, but hopefully the, the reception will be as warm as we would get a burnt supper. Um, but uh, good evening and, and thank you very much for joining us tonight in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I'm Finlay Carson, MSP, and I'd like to welcome you to the Festival of Politics event on radical use of Scotland's land. Uh, this year's festival celebrates its 19th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages from every walk of life to engage in three days of spirited debate. And we're delighted that you can join us today and I look forward to the discussion and hearing everybody's thoughts and views. And it is important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute even uh, where there may be difference of opinion and we can always do that and treat each other in a respectful uh, way at all times. As the convener of the Parliament's Rural Affairs and Islands Committee, uh, which is the partner of this event, I'll be particularly keen to hear your views and thoughts on the issue, uh, which is incredibly important for all our futures. Uh, if you wish to share your thoughts on social media, which is the thing everybody does now, you can do so using the channel at Visit Scott Parl. Uh, or on Instagram. Uh, and I'd also like to remind everybody here tonight that the event is being live streamed on the Parliament's SPTV channel. Now, we use uh, Scotland's land for many different things, uh, providing food, sustaining communities and businesses, and increasingly tackling the climate and biodiversity emergencies. So how can we strike the right balance between all of those? And what could and should be Scotland's, uh, what should Scotland's land look like to help us create a fair and sustainable community for the future? Uh, so tonight, to answer those questions and more, I'm very pleased to be joined today by our expert panel. We have Andrew Thin, Dr Annie McKee and Stephen Young. Now, uh, Andrew is the chair of the uh, Scottish Land Commission and has over 30 years of experience in leadership roles in public, private and third sector, including as the Crofters Commissioner, the chair of Cairngorms National Park Authority and the chair of Natural Heritage, Scottish Natural Heritage. And Annie uh, is a senior social scientist from the James Hutton Institute based in Aberdeen. She leads the Scotland's Land Reform Futures Research Project and is the voluntary convener of Rural Housing Scotland uh, and is also an active member of the community where, where she lives in rural Aberdeenshire. And on my far left, uh, Stephen uh, is the Director of Policy at Scottish Land and Estate. Uh, is a mem uh, he's been a member, it, it's a member organisation uh, for land managers across Scotland. Uh, and with Farm and Roots, Stephen is a partner in the, the family dairy farm and has a background in agriculture and rural uh, cooperatives. So there'll, there'll be plenty of opportunity for members of the audience to put questions and views to the panel. Uh, but I would like to open uh, myself by asking our panellists a couple of questions. So uh, let me start with your visions for the future. Andrew, the, the, the Land Commission states that its programme of land reform aims to create a Scotland where land is owned and used in ways that is fair, responsible and productive. So can you explain that vision a bit more and, and, and what will Scotland look like when your work is complete? Um, so three words that mean completely different wor things to completely different people. So that makes this actually quite a difficult thing to define and it is very complicated and it does come down to individuals. There is no single answer to what Scotland should look like. Um, let, let's just look at things that we know. So we know, history tells us that central any attempt to centrally plan land use is unlikely to be particularly successful. Um, even Stalin towards the end admitted that actually, um, and the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, at least in part because of its sustained attempts to do exactly that. So there's one thing we know, central, central planning of land use is probably unwise. Second thing um, that we pretty much know that um, Economies of scale in relation to land very rapidly become diseconomies of scale at a certain point and, and where that point is reached depends on the type of land and all the rest of it. And in some circumstances those, those economies or diseconomies of scale can become localised power monopolies um, which inhibit innovation and inhibit growth and diversity. Um, so there's another thing we know 
uh, and have known Axis for quite a long time. And I guess the third thing that we know, if you stop and think about it, as I'm quoting the late Simon Pepper uh, here, who said this to a meeting of landowners, didn't go down well, he, he said, um, ultimately in a democracy you need the consent of the people for what you want to do. Um, not a bad quote that actually, and I think it is something that actually we know that. Um, and history tells us that actually. You can get away for a while with doing things that the people don't want you to do, but ultimately in a democracy, and arguably even in a dictatorship, you cannot get away with it forever. So there's, there's kind of three truisms I think are helpful. Um, so I think the priorities for land reform and, and, and for the Land Commission, although I won't be chair for much longer, so someone else may have another view, we do need to devolve land use incentives and land use regulation. And we've put together um, proposals for um, local land use partnerships of some form or another. But, but, but the, there's little doubt that centralising all of that in Edinburgh doesn't make an awful lot of sense. Secondly, we absolutely must free up access to land so that more people, far more people actually, can have access to land. We've, we are closing out potential innovators, potential drivers, potential people who can make our rural areas flourish. We're closing these people out. Um, so we must free up access to land. We must find ways of releasing probably mostly small, fairly small bits of land. Um, and you can see where these bits of land do get released. It's extraordinary what people do with them. And we must challenge monopoly power where it exists. And I'm not, I don't want to overstate this because it's not, it's not a, it's not, a, it's not as if the whole of Scotland is a monopoly. But there are pockets of monopoly power and we must challenge that, I think. And thirdly, I think we must start treating local communities um, as the hosts that they are. They are the hosts for whatever land has been using. They host pylons, they host wind turbines, they host forests, they're the hosts. And actually, you know, Local, local communities, hosts, should be treated with good manners and they should get something out of the deal. That's not an unreasonable thing. If we can get this right, and it will take time, this is not as if there isn't a magic switch, there's no magic wand, but over time I think we will see significantly more diversity of ownership and diversity of tenure. It's not just ownership. After all, if you look at the crofting townships, ownership's concentrated, tenure's highly diverse. Um, but we will see more diversity, and I think that will be a very good thing. We will see more innovation. I do not doubt that. We absolutely must. I also think we'll, we'll actually see more collaboration. If you look at um, what happens in the Netherlands, for example, where my daughter lives, um, land holdings are quite small, innovation is rife, but so is collaboration. Um, I think we will see much stronger local support for the way in which our land is used if local people feel they've got a genuine say in it. It's because people feel disenfranchised, slightly misusing that word, but I'll, I will. They feel disenfranchised. That is why a lot of local people are pretty fed up, actually, with the way their land's being used. Um, and ultimately, I think we will get to a place where landowners are popular, respected people in our country. And that... Uh, you know, we are much more at ease with ourselves when it comes to the whole way in which we own and use our land. Thank you, Andrea. Well, that's certainly uh, given us some food for thought. Um, I'm going to come to you, Stephen. You, you represent an organisation that does have a lot of very large uh, landowners. Um, and, uh, you know, Andrew's suggesting maybe that innovation is reserved to, to small landowners uh, or, or it stimulates innovation. Is that, would that suggest that the landowners, the larger landowners in Scotland uh, are not as in innovative? Um, do, you, could, do you share the view uh, and the vision of uh, the Land Commission? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> I mean, firstly, I mean, our membership is extremely diverse. We've got large landowners, we've got small landowners, just like everyone else. And I don't think innovation is, uh, is the preserve of small land holdings in any, by any means. You can see innovation right across the, the piece. And I think, as Andrew mentioned, collaboration. We see a lot of innovation through collaboration, which is, po is possible and is enabled through scale to allow that to, to take. I've got broader shoulders there. So I think there's... Um, there's a huge uh, diversity there. Um, in terms of scale as well, and you know, Andrew talked about some of the, the disbenefits of scale, certainly in terms of biodiversity, then, then scale 
scale wins, to be perfectly honest, in terms of uh, landscape scale recovery of nature. That, that does help with scale. And you can do it through collaboration. I spent a lot of my life working with farmer cooperatives, and uh, believe me, it's tough. It can be done, but it's extremely tough. So scale is, is extremely important. But I think this comes back to the, the question of what is land for in Scotland. I think that kind of comes down to it. I think anyone who's heard me speak recently will be bored of me saying this, but <clears throat> land in Scotland is under extreme amounts of pressure. It's been asked to produce so much for, uh, for society as a whole. And it's been asked to produce food and fibre, it's been asked to supply jobs, enhance biodiversity, reduce carbon emissions like every other um, sector, but no other sector has been asked to do all of that and sequester carbon at the same time. So there's huge pressure coming onto land. And I have to, we have to try and figure out how we're going to get it to deliver all of those things. And to do that, we have to be really clear of what we're actually asking before we can, we can decide how we're going to deliver it. So I, I think, um, I mean, far be it from me to, to agree with Andrew, so, so I won't. Um, there's, uh, <laughs> but, but generally we do largely, I mean, in terms of the, the social license that Andrew's talking about. To totally agree on that. Responsible land ownership is something that we are fully behind. We've done a huge amount of work on that. We've worked with the Land Commission. Our um, landowners' commitment was a, kind of superseded the land rights responsibility statement, and we've worked with the Land Commission on how to do that, to embed those voluntary principles. Um, and I think there's been a huge amount of progress there. Transparency as well. We very strongly support that. There's some issues with resources on the Register of Scotland, but actually, uh, as a whole, that is improving and moving forward. Register of Controlling Interest as well. So we, we support many of the aims um, of what the Land Commission are trying to do. There's just maybe some ways around how, how we do it that we might differ on, but I don't think we're miles apart and we have a good, uh, good working relationship um, in trying to deliver that. Thank you. Annie, as someone who, who lives and supports a, a, a rural community in Aberdeenshire, is there any flaws that you can see in, in the Land Commission's uh, vision or, or, or further opportunities we can see? <laughs> Uh, and as I said on the way in, I never speak. I'm always the one asking the questions, so and I would never disagree publicly with that, with the land commission. Um, but I think that's really interesting. I think one thing that Andrew didn't touch on was about biodiversity that Stephen brought in. Then, so that's certainly part of my vision is about having functioning e ecosystems that are providing ecosystem services to those local communities. Um, so that's part of that natural capital discussion and what land is for, but also that you know land has its intrinsic value you know wildlife and nature is there because we are part of it as well so that's something to forget uh, not forget uh, but i'm really passionate about involving local people and local communities how we define that's also part of the discussion in how land is managed and how land is used so there's a lot more to be done on that i think we're just tinkering on the edges when you talk about uh, biodiversity, uh, much of the policies come out now uh, recognise the advantage of landscape size projects. Um, and often it's the bigger landowners that can deliver on those landscape sized uh, ambitions. Do you see any issues with smaller um, collections of communities trying to deliver the same? Is there, is there a critical mass uh, that communities may not be able to achieve to, to deliver some of the biodiversity and climate change targets that we have? Yeah, that's a really good question. And probably my colleagues in the James Hutton Institute would be better placed uh, because there's lots of analysis, data analysis, data being collected on habitats, climate projections, those sorts of things. I don't think that um, we should you know, put any barriers in the place of communities who are working at a small scale who are delivering benefits at that level because that's engaging people in the bigger processes and informing them as well so then they might be able to have a, you know, well-informed discussion with the landowner at scale about what they want to see happen. Um, yes, there, we know, uh, you know, that land management doesn't always work well across boundaries. I'm sure, Stephen, you know and understand this as well. So we need that in improved collaboration. We need, you know, enhanced deer management groups and, and in including more local voices in that discussion and not having kind of standalone discussions about forestry management plans rather than thinking about the bigger picture and what that means for kind of social, economic and environmental benefits and assets. I'm sorry going to stick with that. You know, we, we have many ambitions for our country, um, but perhaps uh, we can summarise them as uh, maintaining fair and sustainable communities while meeting our climate and biodiversity targets. Um, so to concentrate on communities first of all, how do you think we should think about land when looking at building and maintaining sustainable communities? Uh, what role does it play and what different options do we have? I'm going to, I'm going to stick with you again, Annie. Okay. Well, I, I hear what Stephen was saying about the pressure on land, 
but land is everything. You know, we can't really do anything without land. And it's the, it provides all prospects for delivery. I always say that Mark Twain quote about how they don't make it anymore. Actually, there is new land, so I haven't got to stop saying that. Um, but I think that you can't, under, you, know, you can't underplay the importance of access to land for communities. So that's not only ownership, it is about, you know, leasing or you know, gifts or kind of using small spaces as meanwhile spaces for, for communities and looking at things slightly differently and looking for mutual benefit as well, um, where, you know, there's some, an idea that a community has that a landowner perhaps hasn't thought of that then might provide an additional income source or an asset that they haven't been able to provide. So I think land is really fundamental. Um, it's the main barrier, basically, where land is not available to community development. So I've done research on uh, community land-based activities, so where communities are trying to lead on the development of affordable housing or renewable energy or uh, active travel paths, cultural activities. And it, the main theme is if the landowner is not willing, then that doesn't happen. Um, and so we need to yeah, show the benefits of being able to provide those sorts of access to land. The only other thing I would add to that is it's also the right land at the right time in the right place and often at the right price. And so those sorts of layers kind of add into that challenge. It's not just here's a bit of land, make best use of it. It's about, you know, what can we make best use of? You know, where is the best spot? And I hear, Andrew, about land use planning at scale, um, but I think we could uh, bring in a bit more of a science-based approach to land use planning um, and thinking about what data we have around making land more resilient to climate change, for instance, or looking at habitat mapping and how that might overlap with the social benefits that we want from land. So hopefully, again, what my colleagues are doing in the James Hutton Institute is integrating some of that data that might be able to inform some of those discussions. Andrew, you know, again, thinking about land, when we look at building, maintaining sustainable communities, how would you def define sustainable? It's one of these words that lots of people have lots of different de definitions. Does, does a community need to be growth? Does there need to be growth within a community for it to sustain? What, what's your definition of a sustainable community and how, how can land support that? Uh, well, well, let me answer it in a slightly different way because, you know, it's another of these words that everyone in this room will have a different definition. So I'm not sure how useful it is trying to put hard definitions down. But let's just think about communities and land. So, so, so there's, a, there's been a bit of a tendency, I think, to say, well, can, the community can own that wood and that's their bit. And then the other bits belong to different landowners. But actually, if you talk to people in many rural communities in Scotland, if not most, they'll just say, this is our land. It happens to be privately owned, but it's our land. Um, and I think what where we need to get to in Scotland is to a place where the way in which that land is used has the consent of the people. That, back to my phrase, um, the, the local people will decide what's sustainable from their point of view, which is why I'm not going to define it for them. <laughs> They'll decide, and, and they should decide. You know, Stalin was rather good at trying to decide it at the Soviet Union scale. It didn't work. Um, so let, let's, let, let's, let's stop this thing, thinking about this idea that communities can have that wee pocket there, usually some pretty trashy piece of land, and the rest of it somebody else's. It is the community's land in a real socio-political sense. And therefore, we have to move to a place where land use decision making is genuinely an, uh, an interactive place between mm -hmm. the community and those who, for very good reasons, have you know a stake in the game, a, a, an investment, and, and all the rest of it, but but people aren't stupid. You know, there's often I often also hear people telling me, oh well, communities they can't do that; they wouldn't understand it. You know, it's too difficult. That's rubbish. And if 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 it is the case that communities genuinely don't understand it, it's because it's been badly explained. It's nothing. It's not a failure on the part of the community. Stephen. Yeah, I think um, going back to the, to the bigger question, the community should play a role in that and should have a, kind of a voice within that as well. But I think there's also a, a thing here, there's, a, a, there's an assumption that there's a homogenous view of the, the community that, who all want the same thing. And I don't think that's really, um, really true to say. We see lots of 
varying views on things. Forestry can be extremely divisive, um, for, for example. And also, I think, uh, as Andrew, Andrew saying, you know, the community are too stupid to do it. I think I've, I've never heard anyone say that. But I have heard people say, well, the, the landowner would just say no if we asked anyway. So actually, the, getting those conversations happening. And the other thing I would like to just point out that this discussion as if landowners and community are polar opposites who've never met each other and don't know who each other are, to be honest, is nonsense. You know, so many of our members, I mean, we need to do some work on this. One of my members said, look, this is, how do I co communicate with the community? Well, I drink in the same pubs, kids go to the same school, we shop in the same shop. I I'm here, come and speak to me. You know, so I think that, that kind of, maybe it's a cultural thing we need to get past, of not actually um, of that assumption there as well. Um, Again, in, in some of the research that we did on the, on the well-being economy contribution of estates, one of the key things that came out was estates being this community anchor. So being able to, to anchor a lot of the activities in the community, whether it is small business units, whether it's employment, whether it's housing, whether it's um, you know, land for the rugby club, you know, all this sort of thing as well. And in terms of the kind of gifting land or land at the right price in the right place, well, not to come back to it, but to, to gift a parcel of land at the right price, you're probably going to have to have scale to be able to do that, to have broad enough shoulders to, to take that on. So I'm not saying it's the only way, but I'm going to say that that's one of the ways that it does happen. And that, but, but do we want to get into that kind of feudal kind of relationship as well, where it's gifted as such, or you know, that sort of thing? So we need to have a, a, a more kind of mature conversation around that, I think. Sorry, I'm not saying it's immature. So, so, <laughs> so, so does there need to be a little bit more honesty uh, around the, the challenges and opportunities? Um, and I think what you're saying, uh, yeah, landowners are absolutely part, part of the community. Absolutely, I think there is that, that honesty and, and, and maybe some community groups don't have the skills to do what, what they want to do, but maybe the, the estate next door does, so could they do it in collaboration? You know, so, so rather than just say, well, this won't work, we'll, we'll just bang heads, let's walk away, let's actually see how it, how it goes forward. Mm -hmm. well, well, we'll no doubt come back to it and, and touch on, on these topics again, but I'm going to stick with you, you Stephen, as, as the farmer uh, on the panel. Or the ex-farmer, mm -hmm. reformed or otherwise. Um, farming has, has, has been an essential part of, of Scotland's, uh, for Scotland for, for as long as people have lived here. And farming has, has played a, a massive role in, in shaping the landscape that we, we love. Um, and, and even now, in, in times of international trade, agriculture and food security are still uh, of particular importance. But how can agriculture continue to be a, a key part of, of how we use our land and how can we best uh, manage and decide how we use the land for agriculture? Yeah, I don't think it's a question of how it can be a key part of how we, how we use the land. It is a key part of how we use the land and it will continue to be a key part. I don't think there's any getting away from that. I'm just having a look to see if there's anyone in here that I'm likely to offend uh, with any of my answers as a, as a pretended dairy farmer, as I describe myself. Um, but I think we, we will look at, uh, at land use and, and different types of land. We've got a real variation in quality of land throughout Scotland. We've got some of the best land for growing crops, raising livestock and all the rest of it. We've also got some hill land and things that are not particularly well suited. We've got some scrub land which you can't do a huge amount with. Um, so in, in my opinion, I think we'll probably look and say, well, there'll be bits of Scotland which possibly will become intense and more intensive and will produce food. And they probably should produce food because that's what they're, they're really good at. But there'll be others which maybe aren't quite so well suited for producing food and maybe they'll produce less and they'll work for biodiversity and they'll work for uh, carbon sequestration. Um, I, I don't think it's good to go down the line of every farm must have X percent handed over to nature. Wales have tried to go down that route and that's opening up a whole can of worms. I think you're far better off to say this land is best suited for this activity. Let's do it there and do it really well. This land's not, so let's do something there. But uh, um, I think Jobs and community are really important in this part as well. Agriculture is a really integral part of community. It's an integral part for a lot of jobs and things. And we do hear quite a lot, and I know frustration for a lot of farmers as people talk about green jobs. You know, what is back to Andrew saying, what do these words actually mean? But just saying green jobs isn't a job. You know, we've got to look at it and we're going to say, well, what's not green about the jobs we've got? How do we develop that? How do we keep the skills we've got in rural Scotland and build upon what we've already got rather than trying to start again? Again, you, you've obviously got uh, considerable involvement in rural, rural housing and whatever. But again, agriculture um, requires workers, and, and the, the, the businesses that depend, uh, agriculture depends on, they need, they need workers and, and, and whatever. You know, Stephen was talking about we maybe need to, I think I'm, I'm going to put words in your mouth, but we need to farm more actively the land we're already farming just now and, 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 and farm that hard. Uh, some people would suggest we, we, we uh, apply biodiversity and, and climate change uh, policies across the board, no matter what the land type might be. 
Can you see us uh, having policies in the future where we, we really farm intensively in areas that we know we can and, and maybe take the foot off the gas, so to speak, in areas where biodiversity and, and climate change could take uh, a, a bigger priority? Uh, that makes me feel quite uncomfortable. Uncomfort uh, I'm not uh, an expert in this, but that sounds like the land sparing, land sharing debate, which doesn't sound very successful. Um, I do, um, I'm more of an advocate of integrated land use. So I don't think that we should have figures or necessarily apply that to every single holding. Um, but I think we should be encouraging farmers to farm with nature because there's so many benefits and we can see that, uh, you know, with you know, very many examples. We can also see the social benefits of it. So some research I read recently um, from Australia looked at afforestation and in particular where farmers had planted trees on their farm that helped to sustain in particular their farm their farming family ha having an additional income source but also the secondary services locally that they they relied on where farms were sold or were leased for forestry on a, on a bigger scale than communities changed. They didn't necessarily decline, but it wasn't the same people that were there and there certainly weren't the same sorts of services and kind of integration. So I think it's a really complicated question and putting it into that sort of black and white, let's farm hard. I think also it's about food systems. Again, I'm straying into territory. How, you started with housing and I was like, oh, that's fine. And now we're talking about food systems. Um, uh, we need to be enhancing local food systems and working on ways that we keep food local and producing what we need in, a, in those sorts of spaces and again involving people and different types of people in, the, in that sort of food production um, because we're at risk if we're just producing more and we're not actually solving a, a global issue around food and nutrition and we should be looking at what nu you know nutritional pr produce it, uh, the land produces what nutrition the land produces not just what food and where you know what type of food and where that's actually going i think there's a big question there about growing grain for whiskey or growing grain for people to eat and what they actually need locally um but i think also we we need to be building in you know we need to be encouraging more young people into agriculture and that's where that housing question comes in one of the main barriers to young people taking on farms or having access to land is lack of housing and housing is fundamentally a, a land question we also know from research that if people um, are, you know, succeed on farms, are inheriting farms earlier, they're more likely to take innovative, innovative steps and not follow a kind of pathway that previous generations have set. And new entrants are certainly more interested and able to take on agroecological farming as well. There, that, that seems to be a pathway. Um, so I think uh, building in more diversity in agriculture and encouraging more young people through all sorts of different routes is really important. And again, it's not only about farm in, inheriting farms, or owning land it's about joint ventures share farming uh, working with community owned lands um, you know options for new crofts all sorts of innovative ways Stephen's edging to come in before I bring Andrew back in. Just, just to clarify, I wasn't meaning that kind of farm it hard in certain ways, and, and, and I, 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 we would uh, um, support kind of uh, nature-friendly farming techniques as well. But I think there are areas of the country which are best suited for producing food, which we should do more pr production of food from. But I don't think that has to be at the expense of biodiversity and climate per se. I think there are ways of, of integrating too. The other thing I was just going to say, in terms of food and local food chains, we're at a real critical mass point in Scotland at the moment. We're losing um, production. We're losing processing capacity so so much of quality produce in Scotland goes south goes abroad to get processed and then we buy it back again and all the value leaves the country so we have to have that processing capacity and that's timber beef lamb it's, it's everything we lack processing capacity I'm sorry so I'm going to go off script here a little Andrew um, but we're talking about the values of land when it comes to biodiversity or food security and whatever um, and, and should we start and baseline everything and, and work out exactly what the natural capital is of every piece of land in Scotland and work out the value of that in terms of biodiversity and, and, and um, you know, climate change mitigation? And should we also decide, as, as, as a, a nation, how much food we want to produce as a nation, how much we want to import, and then decide how much land we need to actively farm? And, and, and provide that food security. Is that not a sensible place to start uh, rather than where we are at the moment? So actually work out what the end game is rather than uh, almost, you know, we're looking at the agricultural bill, we feel we're kind of tinkering around the edges. Should we, should we be more radical when it comes to looking at how different patches of land are used? 
So, uh, well, I'm very cautious about trying to centrally plan land use of Scotland for the next 20 years. I, 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 I'm just inherently cautious about that. The reality is that actually quite a lot of people are baselining on uh, ecological status, on carbon status, because they know perfectly well that if they've got a baseline, then they'll be able to sell credits. And if they haven't got a baseline, they won't be able to sell credits. So that's happening anyway. I don't think government needs to do it. Um, uh, I, I am very confident that Scotland will sell carbon sequestration uh, on a global market. We've got tremendous opportunities to do that. Now, you can argue about whether that's greenwashing or not. There's lots of arguments to be had around all of that, and people will get very um, hot under the collar about it. But, but that, that's my expectation, is that we'll sell carbon sequestration opportunities <laughs> widely. And, and the market will do that. I'm not sure that, you know, government needs to regulate the market rather than start, you know, baselining and all the rest of it. And well, we're not it, already seeing problems with that, where we're seeing land prices, for example, in, in, in my part of the country, in the Fries and Galloway, where an acre of productive agriculture is now selling at £10,000, where, you know, we would expect it about six. And, and on the back of that, it's... it's tree planting or whatever that's, that's really, uh, uh, you know, well, setting the base for, for, for agricultural land. And is the horse bolted? So I, I think we need to be very careful to not to conflate tree planting with carbon sequestration. Um, so it is absolutely right that the pretty generous incentives for tree planting and the um, relatively light touch uh, obligations that go with those uh, uh, incentives mean that land prices are soaring in certain places where you can plant trees. That's happening. Uh, we've said very clearly that we think that those incentives should be uh, reviewed very carefully to make sure that um, with, with, with the right, if you like, to plant trees and get money for it, go significant obligations, very more, significantly more than now. So I think that's fine. Um, it is true that land prices are rising because speculative investors are, th are thinking if we buy that we may be able to uh, sequester carbon 20 years down the line and make a lot of money. So that's happening too. I don't think, and, and our research shows that that's not the main driver, trees, trees is the main driver. Um, and I don't think we should be afraid of using Scotland's to, land to sequester carbon if there's a market there, if we can make, make a decent income for the country out of that, why not? Um, the more difficult one, I think, is biodiversity credits because it's not at all clear how that will work. But there are speculative investors in land for quotes unquote rewilding who are baselining it, you know, measuring birdsong levels and all the rest of it with a view to selling, hoping to sell bi biodiversity um, mm -hmm. uh, credits on that. Uh, that's much more speculative. And again, I don't, I don't think that's driving prices anywhere near as much as the tree planting. So I, I think disaggregating that would be helpful. Just before we, we go to the audience, ask some questions, I'm going to pull it all back together. So how do we balance all these competing demands? Now, we've not even touched on, you know, you were the chair of a national park authority. So tourism is, is obviously very important. So uh, maintaining a landscape to attract tourists is, is, is also a, a demand, if you like. So it might be a false dichotomy, but what is more important for the immediate future? Is it tackling climate change and biodiversity, uh, uh, or is it empowering communities uh, and diversifying land ownership? Where, how does it all come together? So, so Parliament put in place in 2002, whatever it was, Na National Parks Act, um, this requirement that national park authorities would produce a park plan. So that was the, that was the earliest attempt in Scotland to go to, to, go to some sort of localised or regionalised land use planning. And it has worked to an extent, I would say. I wouldn't overstate this, but it has worked to an extent. Um, and I think that's fine. I, I am quite clear that we, we need to get to a place where where we are providing, particularly, particularly around incentives, but also to an extent under regulation, that needs to be more locally driven than it is. I, I don't think it makes sense to have the same incentive for tree planting in Galloway as Caithness or whatever. It just doesn't, and, and the people of Galloway are probably telling you that, actually. Um, so let, 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 let's do that, but let's, let's not over 
plan. I mean, you, you can go so far, you can create framework, you can create incentives, you can all this do it, but then let's, let's let small scale innovation flourish. And, and just while I've got the floor, I'm, I am not arguing that all land should be held in small pockets. I'm not arguing that. What I, am say, what I am saying is that we need a lot more small pockets and there are an awful lot of people telling us that they want small pockets to do stuff and we're holding back innovation and enterprise and all the rest of it because there isn't enough in the way of small pockets. But there will also be bigger holdings as well, that's fine. And if Parliament does proceed to put a public interest test in place, as has been proposed and much talked about, then there will be a mechanism for assessing whether the size of something has got too big that it's no longer in the public interest. I'm going to bring Stephen in, but there's one little thing I want to ask. What, what's the role of regional land use partnerships? And do you think they'll recognise exactly what you explained to us? So we don't want to have a plan of what's happening. It's surely that's what regional land use partnerships are, have set out to do. Well, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, it's, we're still experimenting, and it's, this, is, this is all very new stuff, and I think it's all very difficult. And... and other people, and no doubt will hear it actually, <laughs> other people will have a different view. I do not think that producing a kind of blueprint for Galloway, you know, we'll put potatoes here, barley here, trees there, cows there, I don't think that's the job of government, local or national, actually. Uh, I think creating frameworks absolutely is as to how you want to prioritise. So do we want to spend so much money on trees or should we not be spending some of the tree money on this? Or if we're going to spend money on trees, should there not be some community demand put into it as well? There's a whole different thing. That, that, can, that sort of thing is sensibly done through a local land use partnership. But I personally do not think a local land use partnership should be producing some sort of blueprint. That's taking us down the central planning route, which failed. Um, 100 years ago. Okay, yes, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I mean, taking, it, taking it back to that competing, competing demands, I think it's pretty clear, you know, that, that the climate change is the number one at the moment, and I think the forestry issues are a symptom of that to an extent because that is a market intervention to try and sequester more carbon to meet climate change targets. So I think that is what's happening, and it is that government market intervention which has probably not been dynamic enough to. to to adjust to the emerging markets and emerging situations. In terms of the regional land use partnerships, we, we were quite supportive of them in terms of doing that. And, and as Andrew says, providing that framework of these are the sort of activities that we want to see um, in Galloway or the borders or, or, or the national parks. But in terms of national parks, in, Andrew, the national park plans literally do what you're saying. They, they, I've seen them draw lines on a map and say, we want trees there and we want to do something else there. And I think I, I quite agree, a framework, not a kind of are mapped out, this is the activity that must happen here. I think we have to remember the national parks as well. They're national parks, not nationalised parks. So there are people within the parks trying to run businesses and trying to run their own lives as well. So while you can encourage things, it's not a case of government stamping them and saying this is what happens from now. So it's, it's getting that balance. And the other thing I was just going to say is that, that all of this, particularly biodiversity, and we've touched on carbon credits, we've touched on biodiversity credits. Sorry, Anne, I just want to speak. The, the, you know, nature's got said there's a £20 billion finance gap over the next 10 years. This needs private finance to work. So we have to work with people to deliver that for everyone. Annie, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to, to touch on, on your views on, 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 on the, the competing uh, demands. But also, I want to go back. You, you commented about whiskey and the rights are wrong of whiskey. <laughs> um, I'm being devil's advocate here, but whiskey generates a huge tax take. And a lot of that money is then uh, well, put into the general spending pot, which then goes back to support biodiversity, climate change, food production. Um, how, how do you decide how much we, we should allow our, our land to be used to grow whisky, which ultimately has knock-on benefits and, 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 and knock-on uh, issues? So could you touch on that as well, yeah, please? I have no idea. But sorry. <laughs> that was a bad example. I mean, I've got, uh, a colleague has got a map of all kind of the distribution of different land uses if we package them together. So if we put all of whisky growing, it's basically like the whole of Aberdeenshire or something like that. But golf courses are the whole of Shetland and uh, vegetable production is basically Arran. You know, so actually there is a bit of a balance there that we need to weigh up. Um, should we be actually trying to grow more fruit and vegetables that we're going to eat? But yeah, the economics of it is, is really fundamental. And so we need to think about that. But we also, and, and again, going back to the work that my colleagues do, is look at uh, barley production under different climate scenarios. So we're relying on this as a, a large e income source for the country. But actually, are we going to be able to keep producing the barley that then we rely on? And where should it then grow and how can we make that land? 
um, you know, that land resilient from flooding, uh, wildfires, all these sorts of things. Um, I'll go back to competing demands because um, I think that there is a false dichotomy that you, you touched on at the beginning and, and actually the final part that you said, Anne, um, Stephen, about drawing people in is really critical. We need to ensure that we have a just transition. So that relies on empowered communities, uh, whoever they are, because I think there's a lot of discussion there, communities within communities, communities of interest, informed uh, participants and citizens. Um, so I think we can't let people, out, let people kind of be left behind in any way. I think what I'm very concerned about is just the increasing power imbalance and inequality that's happening because of this drive, because of this market focus on land at the moment that communities so local people, let's put it in that sort of language, are really being left behind and it's not the language that they speak. So for me, as a rural Aberdonian who does social research, um, now I'm all of a sudden having to understand funding and speculation and hedge funds and stuff like that. And I think we need to rapidly um, allow communities to have capacity to engage in those sorts of conversations and also bring these sort of um, market forces down to the local level and to look at what the, the impact is on a local scale. So, yeah, there's a big, there's loads of interesting research to do in that anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, Stephen. Very, very brief. I think that's a really important point you've touched on there, but what is the public interest? Oh, yes. You know, is this national interest, which is tree planting, which is government national policy, local interest? We, we regularly see local people don't want what they see as a ten, intensive planting and, and, and lorries and all the things that, that brings. So, yes. so that is the big, big question. What is the public interest? I think that's the sustainability question as well that Andrew didn't answer. I think trying to define <laughs> that those things is is quite important but also we don't want to draw lines around things either so defining sustainable development also then means that something else isn't sustainable development or sustainability um, but we definitely need to do that bottom up top down because what's in a local community's interests from a sustainability perspective it may not be from the national interests and so at what point is there that kind of compromise and who decides on that I think is quite tricky so when I talk to communities I always say look you're informing the public interest by telling me what you think at the moment because you are the public and we just need to look at this um, at, at a national scale we often talk about local and rural and in, in my view well, 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 I think about countryside areas but what about urban? Where, where does urban fit into radical uh, land reform? Andrew, um, communities, we think about local communities. We always, my mind always thinks about villages and small towns, but how, how do you apply um, radical land reform? Does any of what we're talking apply to urban Scotland? So it is interesting, I mean, and a lot of Scottish voters also assume that land reform has got something to do with, with rural, and, and prob probably something in the far northwest in many, way, in, in many ways. Uh, land reform is absolutely relevant to urban, and we have done some work. I would like to do more, actually, because that's where the bulk of Scots are, uh, and uh, uh, so only working on rural is in many ways excluding the interests of a lot of Scots. We did a lot of work. I mean, Scotland has an appalling record on vacant and derelict land in urban areas, appalling by European standards. It's really disgraceful, particularly West Central Scotland. But uh, and, and what's also really appalling is that the, if, if the, the bottom sort of 20%, uh, if, if you try and zone things by socioeconomic uh, w welfare, um, the, the most deprived areas in Scotland are the ones that are closest to, to vacant and derelict land. Uh, and there's no doubt there's some sort of correlation in there. So we did a lot of work on that. I think Scotland is beginning to do the right things and beginning to make progress on that, but it's got a long way to go. The other thing, I think, to, uh, to say briefly about urban, uh, although there are a lot of things to say, but the other thing that is particularly relevant is, is the, the power issue applies just as much in urban as it does in, in rural. There are localised monopoly power blocks in urban, in urban land holdings, uh, and actually quite small bits of land can create enormous power in an urban environment. Um, I chaired Scottish Canals for eight years, uh, which is a land ho landowner, but it's a public corporation answerable to the Scottish people. And we, uh, we did our level best to make the very most of that land holding for the benefit of the Scottish people, but we were frequently blocked from doing so, or, or it was made a lot more difficult by the fact that private individuals were sitting on chunks of land and, and exerting that power in a manner contrary to the public interest. You know, if, if you ask me uh, as a rural constituency MSP, when it came to land reform, 
what, where's the, the biggest challenges? And I don't get letters from lots of communities complaining about rural land. Most of the, the concerns are over our town centres. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those properties are owned by pension funds and uh, banking groups. So Sunra are the problems that the George Hotel and uh, Newton Stewart, it's the, the Grapes Hotel and Castle Douglas, it's the Merrick and Dumfries, it's X, Y and Z. Um, and there seems to be a real impasse there. But most of the, my inbox, it's urban land uh, issues that, 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 focus, uh, that the constituents focus on. Um, that hasn't actually been my experience. So I, I, um, I hold a public meeting every month somewhere in Scotland. And in fact, <coughs> since the pandemic, we've gone online, which, which I didn't want to do, but I've, oddly has made it more accessible for a lot of people. So we've stuck with it. Um, but we hold a public meeting nonetheless for a particular geographical location every month. And what's really interesting is that actually a very high proportion of those who come and want to tell us about their priorities are people who want to tell us about rural priorities, not urban priorities, even though often the audiences, if I hold a public meeting in Glasgow, they want to talk about rural. So, uh, but, but that's partly because I think the politics of land is informed by history and all sorts of other things. Um, and we have to try and find a way through that. And I, I, I do believe that Scotland will need to... You know, let me give you another example of work we did in an urban environment. We looked at the possibility of compulsory sale orders, where you've got a speculator and investor sitting on a piece of land, doing absolutely nothing with that piece of land, blighting that particular bit of the city. That, that land could be used, put to very good public interest use, housing, whatever. And that person is sitting as a speculator for 10, 20, 30 years. And that is not in the public interest. And we have recommended and we've done a lot of work on what it would look like, whereby local authorities would be given the power in the public interest, where they could show that it was in the public interest, because this is, takes you into the Human Rights Act, to force that owner to put that piece of land up for auction to someone who would buy it at auction. They'd get fair price by definition. An auction gives you fair price, but it would be then put into good use. So that, that would be urban land reform in action, and it seems entirely reasonable and sensible to me. I suppose, it, from, from your perspective, Annie, it come, the rural housing, there's often the argument that there's actually plenty of houses there, a lot of them are derelict, they need to be brought up to a, a fitting a proper standard. Can you apply that to urban areas? What's your views on uh, that? Yes, although I'm not as familiar with urban housing, I would say. So now communities in urban areas have the same rights as rural communities to buy assets, so land and properties. And we've seen some really good innovations of cooperative housing and renovation and you know building new new housing in urban areas because there's still you know, good access to funds. I know that Community Land Scotland are very busy supporting new community landowners and it's mainly to buy either very small bits of land or buildings to convert into their, the, the use that the community require, whether that's housing or kind of community help. Um, one of the challenges from a research perspective, we've done some research on urban community land ownership and the, the the groups or, uh, you know, the constituted community bodies that are trying to take this forward are challenged just by the, the scale of the problem that they have or by the scale of the community that they have to engage with. So it's quite hard for them to ensure that they've done uh, full community engagement to show whether people are supportive and how it's going to benefit them and also that, to demonstrate that benefit as well. So uh, against these kind of larger um, powerful landowners. So I think there's actually that capacity thing. We think often about small scattered rural communities who don't have you know, the support, but actually urban communities could really do with that. But there's some really good examples. I mean, you've got Portobello here in Edinburgh, and I believe that there's a first part five sustainable development right to buy that's happening in Glasgow. I might be wrong, um, but that's a, a big innovation and that's happening in an urban place. So yeah, there's a lot to learn. Yeah, Andrew, briefly. Just on, on, on housing let's, uh, and setting aside community housing, which is, is, is happening. Yeah. But Let's just bear in mind that in Scotland, the vast majority of houses are built by a very small number of companies. The vast majority of Scotland's potential building land is owned by a very small number of companies. It follows, I think, logically that if you don't intervene in that, then that, that power concentration will not act in the public interest because those, those companies will bring that land forward for building and they'll bring their housing supply forward in a manner that maximises profit. Yeah. And unless you've got a fully competitive market working, 
and I'm all on for markets. I'm not anti-competitive <laughs> anti markets. But unless you've got a fully competitive market working, then, then actually what, that will not work in the public interest. It will work in the, in the interest of maximizing the profits of those companies. So it's a very good example and an urban example of where concentrated land ownership produces concentrated power that acts against the power of the public interest. Steve. Yeah, um, I try not to get involved in things that are urban, to be perfectly honest, but um, I, I think, you know, Andrew's saying about, you know, he, as he's roadshow, um, it is part of that that people are conditioned to think because that's the rhetoric and that's the language that land reform is a, a rural issue, so people don't think that, so when they're writing to you, Finlay, they're probably not thinking it's land reform, they just want a pub. <laughs> they're, they're not thinking about how that all works. But what, what I would say in, in terms of um, legislation things, I mean, the, the forthcoming bill, there's nothing in there that covers urban issues at all, really. There's a little bit about data zones, but no one knows what one of them is anyway. Um, so there's a bit about the, the, the focus on scale over concentration completely misses out all these issues. It can, there is no tools in the box to, to look at that. There's no real focus on it. So um, fr from my point of view, I think there should be, um, partially because I've got plenty to do, and the more about urban, the less I have to do. But I think we need to, need to look at that and, and try and, uh, as, as you say, as Andrew said, that make this as not a rural issue. Yes, there are rural issues, but, but, there's, a, but there's a distinct urban part there as well, particularly in housing. Um, just on, on housing as well, I know our members are, are um, major providers of housing in rural areas. Um, um, we've seen members recently doing joint ventures with social landlords. Housing co-ops is something I'd really like to, to see more of in Scotland. I'm not sure why we don't have that many. I've done work in Canada in the past, and they're all over the place, so there's, there's opportunities there. So I think, again, that joint venture working, working together and trying to, to make that work is, uh, is an opportunity for us. Can I just ask, can, can I have a wee show of hands how many have got rural interests and, and how many come from a, an urban background, just to give us an indication of the split of the audience? If you're rural... Uh, raise your hand. An urban. So we've probably got a, a two-thirds mm -hmm. urban. Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting. We're, we're now going to uh, invite the audience uh, to, to participate in the discussion. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, I've got a question, gentleman down here, it was very quick with his hand. Um, if you raise your hand and keep it raised until you get the microphone, uh, and unlike me, if you could uh, keep your, your questions as brief as possible so we can get as many uh, questions uh, covered. And if you have a particular witness, if we'd like to call him our panellist, uh, you'd like to address your questions if, if you could say that. So, gentlemen down here. Thank you very much. Really interesting discussion. Um, my name's Andrew Heald. I'm a forester. If we're talking about tree planting and forestry, it's a request for clarity. Please, can we be clear about what we mean? It is future timber demand that is driving forestry planting. It is not carbon. Forestry planting is heavily regulated. One of the reasons we haven't hit targets, targets 15,000 hectares a year, we only planted 8,000 hectares a year. 8,000 last year, 11,000 years before. If you speak to the people trying to do that planting, they will be very clear that it is some of the regulation around that planting that's restricting that. So we need more woodlands of all type, more for carbon, more for biodiversity, more for communities and more for timber. The UK is importing a million cubic metres every month of sawn timber and board, OSB, MDF. That's not paper, it's not wood fuel, it's not chip, it's sawn timber and board that's going into construction. Timber production in England and Wales is declining long term. Global demand for timber is going to double, double by 2050. So please, when we're discussing tree planting and forestry at events like this, please can we have a lot more clarity about what we're being discussed. Thanks very much. Okay, right, that's, there's a lot in there. Um, and I'm not sure there was a question, was but <laughs> I am sure, Andrew, given some of his road shows, uh, he was recently in Galloway, um, I'm quite sure you've got some comments, Andrew. And then I'll, I'll go to Stephen. Of course, what you say is true. Um, it doesn't alter the fact that the Scottish Government is pouring very large amounts of money into... You can call it forestry, you can call it woodland planting, I don't really, you know, whatever language you want to use. The fact is that there is a very generous financial programme going on at the moment. Um, we do need to think about how we direct that programme to optimise the, uh, the public interest or maximise the public interest. And I, I think I, I do believe that a one-size-fits-all is probably unwise. And secondly, I do believe that... Um, there is enough room in there, I mean, given how many 
uh, owners of land are, are rushing to take advantage of those schemes, um, there's enough room in there to make greater demands of those in receipt of forestry grant to do... To, to, uh, can I just finish? Um, so I, I think it is reasonable, given, given how uh, uh, the, the demand for those grants, for want of a better word, expression, um, I think it is reasonable to expect people who are applying for the, that public money to seriously consider the wider public value of what they propose to do in collaboration uh, with, with local communities. I think that's a reasonable thing to ask. It's public money. Stephen, um, just, just on that, you know, I, I, I'm going to go back to Galloway. We, we do have some particular issues there where there was lots of mistakes made back in the 1940s, and, and we're looking forward. I think we've got the draft UK forestry plan. I haven't seen it, but it, it, hopefully that, that's coming forward, which does address some of the issues. But again, some of the, the mistakes we made are, are being made again, and, and, and it's not necessarily the right tree in the right place. How, how do we get the balance right again and, and thinking about communities and um, sustainable uh, rural areas? I think there is um, modern forestry is very different from forestry that we're talking about maybe back in the 70s and 60s. There is far more thought goes into planning, and you know there is a planning process. We have to engage with communities. There's you know a lot more regulation around it than there was. We're now seeing you have to certain percentage of natives and and all the rest of it. So I think there is. I, I think forestry, just like everyone else, every other industry, has evolved and changed. I think there have been big improvements. Now, whether it's enough, you could you'd argue, but it's not. You know, the, people talk about blanket Sitka spruce. That doesn't happen. You can't really do that now. Um, you know, but we have to look at uh, NATO as well. We have to look at that commercial timber point as well. Just as we need food security and energy security, timber security is quite a big thing. And it's back to that point around processing as well. And, and some of these plans and what we want to do it is around natives. And you think, well, what is the kind of, where are the jobs in that? Where, what is the community getting from that? They get the amenity, but are they getting the jobs and all the rest of it as well? There's a, a, a push on at the moment for natural regeneration. Now, I, I, I think that's a nice idea, but then if you look at it and say, well, if you want the right tree in the right place, natural regeneration, well, you get the tree that you get. That's kind of how it is. So um, I think we do need to look at forestry, but I think we have to look at forestry in, in the round with every, every other land use as well and not on its own. And it has been kind of treated on its own up to this point. But I think Andy's right. It is, it is regulated. It's not, a, it's not the Wild West. There's certainly a lot of rules around it and a lot of planning elements go into that as well. Annie, um, with, with uh, your rural community hat on, so we're hearing we're not hitting the targets uh, for, for tree planting. Should we forego the, the, the community, so the sustainability of communities and forge on and, and make sure we get these trees planted? And what's the priorities there? Well, I think that, Andrew, your question is really, it was not a question, but a point. It was very, very helpful because I didn't know that. So it's really helpful to have that clarity. And I think my, my point back to that is that people in local communities also don't know that. So they're seeing trees being planted and they don't know what for, or they're hearing about it, or they're being invited to a woodland consultation, which is probably a, following a process that's been well-defined. Um, but I'm hearing through research that we're doing at the moment um, that's touching on afforestation, uh, all sorts of different reasons why trees are being planted that don't seem to be very accurate. So I think there's a message there as well for landowners who are planting trees to be completely open about what their plans are and why, and whether there's an opportunity for community to be involved in that, either, you know, planting trees or other sorts of jobs or training opportunities in forestry. And I'm hearing good things about that as well from the landowners and land managers. So, yeah, I think the lessons from the past are probably what people are coming back to now whilst they're seeing what they think is quite large scale change. Uh, and may maybe it's not actually large scale change, it just feels like it in a local place. So I also recently went to New Zealand. I tell this to everybody because it's so exciting that I went to New Zealand. Um, but they're also having a very similar discussion at a national and local level about land use change for trees. Um, and the, the perception is that this is a great massive shift away from agriculture and it really isn't and, and again the government are quite concerned about meeting targets and ensuring that they meet net zero targets which may be different from, from timber uh, uh, producing timber and actually we need to capture that and there's just a lack of knowledge and a lack of research both locally and nationally to, in, to inform that discussion. But yeah, thank you. I would quite like to stick to the forestry thing. It, 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 uh, supplement in forestry, I'm going to Go to the gentleman here, and then the gentleman right at the very back with his hand up. We'll maybe take two questions. That, have we got two mics? No, I'll run. 
No, we've got a runner. We'll take two together if it's on forestry. Um, uh, my name's Dave Morris. Um, I used to work for the Rambler Association and were much involved in these issues. Mm. Um, a year ago, I spoke to the Forestry Minister, mm. Mary McCallum, and I told her that the Scottish Government was wasting millions and millions of pounds mm. every year on tree planting. And that is because uh, they're planting the trees in the uplands uh, and they are releasing far, far more carbon in that process uh, than they're actually capturing. The trees which you see being planted today, uh, the vast, vast majority are going to be releasing carbon through the disturbance of peaty soils uh, for decades to come. If I agree that we do need to grow trees for timber purposes, particularly to uh, replace steel and concrete in construction. Uh, and uh, you've got to plant those trees in the lowlands. Uh, farmers have got to accept uh, that they're going to have to be uh, growing trees on much of their land where you can grow trees on soils which have been repeatedly cultivated uh, are low in carbon at the present time and will grow much faster than in the hills. Um, but going back to the first point you made about transparency, mm. I have been arguing mm. for the last two or three years about the planting by Brewdog mm. and now by mm. Aberdeen Standard Life Asset Management. Mm. Last week I was told that Aberdeen Asset Management, having bought that land near uh, Newton Moor for £7.5 million, pounds, have now been given... Mm. £2.5 million pounds of Forestry Commission grant to plant hillside, which does not need any planting whatsoever because it can be naturally regenerated. And when I asked Sir Scottish Forestry to explain to me what the £2.5 million was for, they refused. They refused to provide the information. So much for your transparency. It just does not exist. There was another another one on forestry right at the back. The gentleman with his, his hand up right at the very back, and then we'll we'll cover that. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Fenning Wellstead. I had two questions. One was, there's been a lot of talk about the money going into forestry from grants and financial support from the government. Is there any prospect, or what prospect is there, that forestry grants will be integrated with farming grants? so that land users could make a coherent picture. And the second point related to the urban areas, if food security is important, why are we developing grade two, grade three farmland for housing while there are gap sites in the cities? Thank you. I'm, I'm going to go to Stephen to kick off with those. Um, yeah, a couple, a couple of things there from, from both of them. I think, I, I think we do need to plant some uplands. I don't think we can do all the planting on the lowlands. I think there's a lot of upland ground which is perfectly capable of growing good quality trees as well. <laughs> I, I, I do disagree on natural regeneration being a, a, a suitable alternative. I think in some places it can be, but I think to get the scale of planting that we're looking for, I, I just don't think that would be fast enough there as well. Um, in terms of the grants, um, I, I don't know the specific case, obviously, and, and what it is in the Transparency of Forestry and Land Scotland, I'm sure they'll publish their, the, the information that they can, but um, forestry grants are there because there is a huge risk in planting trees. It's not a, it's a very slow process as well, so that there does need to be an incentive to do that. Now, whether the forestry grant scheme is the right scheme to do that, and if there's other methods, possibly yes, but I think we have to accept that with forestry being such a long-term game, game, for people to do that and make that long-term commitment and take that long-term risk, there has to be some sort of incentive there or it won't be there. And I think, as, as was mentioned, even with the incentives, um, we are behind where we, where we want to be, national we in that as well. Um, in, in terms of Ferring's question at the back, yes, absolutely, I think that we'll see more and more of that. And I think there is something that we can look at in terms of forestry grants and being a bit more dynamic in that and saying, well, these commercial plantations, could they, could they have slightly less support in some areas? But we can use that for riparian planting for small scale things, which are with a, a greater cost. But you've got to be careful with that, the economics, just to make sure, because we have got these ta targets to hit. So, but I think there is ways of kind of cutting the, the deck of cards slightly differently to do that. And absolutely, it needs to be integrated with farming so that we have a, a holistic view of what we're doing. Annie, the agroforestry grants, but also maybe touch on transparency and, and uh, 
You know, there's varying views about the, the research that we need. I, I know there was a forestry stakeholder group uh, in November reported that the carbon sequestration of um, the, the, the majority of the trees were planted just now is, is only two thirds what they thought it was a few years ago. So it's a, it's a changing game. How, how do you make sure there's transparency and, and the decisions are making are based on proper science and research? That was what I was going to say. They should be based on proper science and research. <laughs> and uh, colleagues of mine have been doing some really good work about uh, the sequestration rates of different tree species in different types of land. And I think there is quite a lot of concern around planting on peat or, or planting down the hill. And this is something that we've also talked about, uh, about the squeezed middle. So there's this sort of optimum space where everything is happening and is required. And so there is that kind of competing demands that I said earlier that there shouldn't be. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot more openness. And hopefully as researchers, we can also communicate that better. Um, so it's not kind of hidden in a box somewhere or not very well explained um, so yeah do have an explore of our terrible website um, but we do have some really good storyboards around these sorts of things um, I wanted to go to the gentleman's point about housing if that's all right um, I don't know whether there's something more uh, we could talk about there about integrating housing with growing um, so one of the innovations in rural housing Scotland that we've worked on is uh, what we've called smart clacken so trying to reinvent the the clackens of the past where people lived and worked in a kind of shared community space and we've we've got designs and these are being developed on the western isles in particular and the opportunity there is that we meet affordable housing requirements but we also provide people their own growing space and shared growing space to meet some of their own food demands as well as other shared resources like Char car charging points or community spaces, shared recycling, all those sorts of things. So I think it's a bit of uh, flipping planning on its head slightly. So it's not something that the planners in the Western Isles are very uh, happy about um, because it's out with settlement boundaries, for instance, and it may be on land that is you know, tricky to access. Again, there's no money to be made in building houses in rural places, unfortunately. Um, so I think, yeah, there's something there to think about individually meeting our own needs and also supporting community food growing and then also supporting local producers, local uh, processing as well. Um, I think there's just one other point that I was thinking about, um, about new owners that you touched on as well and that this gentleman in the front touched on and I think there's um, perhaps something the Scottish Government need to think about are the, is the level of risk and when kind of Things are talked about by politicians, unfortunately, sorry, Finland, they do influence the market. And what we are maybe seeing is people coming in with big ideas or kind of big money um, and a lot of power because they're pension funds and things. And if they hear something that they don't really like, then they pull away. And some of those benefits or potential opportunities for communities like new housing opportunities or access to land isn't then delivered or maybe put on hold and the community aren't necessarily the person in the room kind of dictating that. So I think there's something there that maybe the new land reform bill will tackle um, around risk and kind of opportunity. That's what I'm hearing in the research is communities are really quite positive about the tree planting in particular, for whatever reason. They like the idea of having more access to new, good walks and tourism opportunities. But what their main fear is that it isn't gonna happen because something might change that means that these kind of new landowners change their minds. Andrew. Just quick on both points. So on the, on, on the housing, um, so we have a planning system in this country that, that, that is democratically accountable and which should to, in, to some extent deal with the point you've made. Mm -hmm. but, but we are unusual by European standards in that, that we rely on the private sector to acquire land on a speculative basis and then bring it forward. In most, of, most other northern European countries in particular, the public sector is much more assertive or muscular in terms of what land is brought forward for housing. So we've, we've done a lot of research on this and we've published on, on it, so I'm just going to refer you to the website, but we could do things a different way in Scotland. You, you are absolutely right on that one. On the question of, of, of integrating forestry and farming, I, I think there's a wider question here. You know, even when the economy is flying and the public finances are in good order, we ain't got enough money for all the things we want to do. Um, and at the moment, our public finances are in an appalling state and our economy is not much better. Um, so, of course, there isn't going to be anything like enough money for all the things we want to do uh, and support in rural Scotland. Which is why I think um, 
Firstly, because I think we'll get a better outcome if we make that more locally accountable. But secondly, frankly, because I think um, if it's not more locally driven, people will get increasingly exasperated and your post box will get even bigger. <laughs> um, for both those reasons, I think determining what, what we spend finite resources on is better done at a local level. And therefore, I'm actually agreeing with you, better done in an integrated way. <laughs> Right, um, we're going to open up again. There's a gentleman here whose arm will fall off if we don't <laughs> ask him because he's had his hand up right from the start. And then I'll go to the lady directly behind him. So we have, again, we'll, we'll take one question uh, this time and, and we can then associate it with other ones. Thanks, that's better already. Um, I'm taking up Dr McKee's point about land being everything and uh, greater inequality. I think I'm right in saying there's fewer tenant farmers than there's ever been. The radical land reformer Andrew White, Andy Whiteman um, has estimated that half of the private land in Scotland is owned by 430 owners. And of course, we now know these owners are not necessarily aristocrats. They're hedge funds, pension funds, banking consortiums. A lot of them are foreign. A lot of them are, are there because of tax avoidance. Um, so. People have also said that it's probably the greatest concentration of land in, in Europe. And, and, and this, uh, Professor Thun has said as much. It's always feudal. And what I've heard today, I don't think breaks through. I and mean, we were supposed to be talking about radical change. <laughs> um, and I, and the, que the question is, you'll be glad to know, um, and by the way, you know, the, the Scottish Government's got the, the land register and it's, and it's created um, the community buyouts. But what I understand is that the community buyout now has been circumvented. It, land exchange estates are now being sold underground, if you like, to bypass that. So we haven't just got the cleverest people in the room, <laughs> these owners, but the most ruthless and probably the most greedy. So, um, would the way forward be um, land value tax? Thank you. Right. I think we'll start with Andrew. Um, so, 53% um, roughly of the nation's wealth is held in the form of land. And that wealth contributes relatively little to uh, the public finances. So. Uh, logically, what you say m must make some sense, that, that taxing the value of land, the value that is in land, does make more s some sense. So, and we've said that clearly, we've produced, uh, please, please look at the website. Um, it, is not, it, it is not a straightforward free lunch, so to speak, it's actually quite a complicated thing. And we did quite a bit of research and we went to other countries that have tried this including other countries that have tried land value tax and then abandoned it because it, was, it didn't work. Um, so I, th I think the short answer is, in principle, yes. In practice, this needs an awful lot more thinking through. It's, you've got the potential for a serious car crash if you go into this half-baked. Stephen, what's your members' thoughts on land value tax? I think they agree with Andrew. <laughs> Um, no, I think, I think Andrew's covered it there. It is a fiendishly complex thing. I think uh, land management activity is low margin um, kind of work. There's no direct correlation between the value of land and the, the income that it, it, that it delivers. So, yeah, I think Andrew's covered it, to be honest. It's, it's hugely complicated. What, one thing I would pick up on, um, there was the, the you mentioned uh, underground sales to avoid community buyouts. That, that, if a community is registered an interest in land, that, that doesn't happen. Um, I think when we're talking about off-market sales, which is a private sale between two individuals, that's not underground, that's two people s selling a business between one and the other. It's the way most businesses are sold um, across the country. So it's not, um, although you probably don't see it in the paper, um, it, it's, not a, it's not an underground sale, it's just not openly marketed. And I think that happens right across all kind of business types. That's not specific to land. And it certainly wouldn't circum circumnavigate um, community buyout regulations. So, Annie, we've got two people who sort of uh, agree that it's, it's a very difficult uh, place to be land value tax. But we've also got the situation, and we've discussed it right up to now, where landowners 
uh, manage the land to produce benefit to the population. So whether that's biodiversity, whether it's climate change, whether it's food security. So they deliver public goods. Is it right that we should have a va land value tax, which then taxes them for that? How, how do you get the balance right on public goods for public money and, and, and tax? OK, uh, I have, again, I have no idea. This is really complicated stuff. This is why we do um, long term research. So I do have colleagues that are working on what we mean by value of land, because land has many different values, again, to all sorts of different types of people with different interests. And that's why we need to think carefully, as Andrea and Stephen have said, it's not just about the financial value that's held in land. Um, I would dispute what you say, though, Finlay, that landowners are primarily doing land management for public benefit. I've never heard that before. <laughs> um, but I think we could try and work towards that. And um, I'm really keen on um, a school of thought from the states that's around progressive property rights. And this is around where we own land for the social good. That's the purpose of property ownership. And I think there's a lot of evidence of that in Scotland, but maybe we need to, again, nudge, uh, you know, use the carrot and the stick in a lot of a, a lot different sure. way. I, I'm, again, I'm a devil's advocate here. So you have farmers who produce food, yeah. which is the most essential energy. Um, those same landowners have wind turbines, which reduce our reliance on fossil fuels and, 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 and greenhouse gas uh, emitting uh, services. Um, we have landowners that restore peatland, which uh, captures. So they do deliver public good. Um, it may not be their primary uh, reason for, for business, but there are very few businesses whose primary reason, other than sub-sector, is to deliver um, public good. Um, so again, it's about the balance, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, uh, well, the thing is, private companies are delivering to their private company objectives and perhaps we just need to again resh reshuffle uh, maybe it's more radical or maybe it's more tinkering and there's a lot of discussion around that um, to ensure that the public good is maximized in those sorts of decisions um, i want to come back on what you said stephen about off-market sales because there has been some really good research commissioned by the land commission um, but done by colleagues at sruc and I think there's, again, just a lack of transparency within local communities about what's actually happening. So one day they get out of bed and there's a new landowner. And that shouldn't happen. I think there should be a lot more uh, pre-discussion, pre-sale discussion informing, because that's actually one of the main controls that the landowner has. So we often hear that it doesn't matter who owns the land, it's how it's used. It really does, because they can decide who to sell it to and when. Um, and there's some really good examples down in Buclu where they had an open discussion about their land management plan and their, what they plan to sell and when, and that gave the community the opportunity to think through their own priorities and then to be able to develop a, a plan to be able to purchase some of that. So if we could encourage more of that again through legislative routes, I think that would be really good. Stephen. Uh, uh, so it's not always possible. You know, people sell land for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it has to be done quickly. Sometimes, you know, you're saying they can choose who they sell it to. Well, they can't really, because you have to have a willing buyer and a willing seller. So there has to be that. So I, I just think that the narrative around that makes it a lot, makes it sound like it's some illegal activity and it's not. It's yeah. selling, it is selling something. And it's, uh, and, and whoever owns it, we've got land rights and responsibilities principles. So it doesn't matter, new owner or old owner, they've got the same principles which they, they should be adhering to. So. Yeah. Very, very briefly. Very quick, almost one sentence. There's 18 countries in Europe that have regulatory interventions yeah. in land sales. It's not an uncommon thing, and, it's, and, and to argue that it would be very difficult or impossible is not the case. Yeah. The lady with her, her hand up <laughs> at the moment. Thank you. My name is Jen Stout. Um, I was really happy, Andrew, to hear you talk about the, did you call it the social, a genuine social political sense in which people who craft the land or, or run the land, own the, um, work on the land, feel like they own it. That was certainly my experience growing up in, uh, I don't think it was a smart clacking, because you didn't really have any electricity most of the day, but you know, it was a, it was a clacking. Um, and I want to come back to crofting. I've got two questions, I'll make them brief. One thing I do want to say first, though, is that I really agree with what this gentleman here says. There's nothing radical about what we've been speaking about. And arguably, there's nothing radical about this debate whatsoever for the last 10 years. And it is maybe that's because there's nothing radical about our parliament these days. Cast your minds back, right? Because I feel like I'm in some weird collective amnesia to 2014, 2015, when we had this incredibly vibrant, big debate about land reform. 
And if we're talking about power and democracy, which I think we should be in this debate a wee bit more, yes, you can't keep using land in a way, or you can't maintain a situation which the majority of people disagree with. And the majority of people in Scotland disagree with us having one of the most concentrated forms of land ownership in Europe, right? But that hasn't changed. And all of those measures that were proposed back in 2014, most of which never made it through, particularly the more radical ones, anything to do with caps on ownership, None of those made it through. We have had good stuff, right? Community buyouts, but there are really big problems with all those. The tenant farmers, have you mentioned, so many evictions. There's so many things you can get into that are wrong and haven't been fixed. And the tinkering is, is a lot. And so has the parliament failed us in that sense? Have we failed to actually tackle this in any meaningful way? And is that a failure of, that's a democratic failure, I'd argue. On the crofting thing, Crofting is actually one of our big hopes. It does, as you say, with this Clacken idea, it does actually provide a really great model, ironically, given its <laughs> tortured history, for how people can live and work and grow food and do all sorts of innovative things in small communities. But they can't because crofting is broken and the Federation has been crying out and saying that it's in complete crisis, this system, for so long. It's almost impossible for young people to get into this, to find a croft. The Airbnb thing, the housing crisis is a massive part of that. And it feels like it's falling on such deaf ears in this parliament. Why on earth is that? Thank you for that contribution, Jen. Um, this is maybe the, the, the appropriate point to ask the panellists what their radical reform is. If they're to pick one radical reform, their favourite radical reform that they'd like to see the parliament implement, um, Stephen. I think I'm probably the most least radical person in the room <laughs> right now, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I would say the radical form is we need to stay focused on outcomes. I think too often we've got caught up in petty squabbling and looking at kind of minutiae, and we really need to look at the outcomes that we want from land and then be really clear on that. Um, I, I think a radical solution is let's not legislate for absolutely everything. We mentioned. Uh, Agricultural holdings there and, and, and crofting as well. I mean, we've legislated agricultural holdings out of existence. They just don't happen anymore. We've potentially done it with crofting as well. Crofting system is, I totally agree, it's, it's currently broken, so we've got to fix that. So, um, so legislation is not always the answer. We have to um, make sure that we don't end up with kind of stagnation and paralysis and, and people just getting angry about things. How do we focus on what the outcomes we want are and then work together to get them? But a lot of that comes down to setting out what we want to achieve, clearly. Annie. Um, first of all, thanks. That was a great point. I really liked how you tie all these things together. I think that's the challenge of these sorts of discussions is it's kind of everything. Um, but it's really important and uh, you're absolutely right that the fundamental question here is around power and democracy, uh, which is tricky, but also a, like prim a primary interest. And there's a lot to learn from other places and their approaches to democracy as well. So my radical reform, maybe I'm again not as radical. I, I'm a very, you know, I'm trained as a researcher to be completely objective. Um, so this is a rare opportunity to say what I think. Um, I think we do need to have much stronger rights for communities to make decisions around land. And I think that one of the things that should happen in the bill is that land holdings, perhaps it's a scale press question, and there's a cultural discussion there as well, um, have community representation, local representation in, in the decision making room around the table. And maybe we talk about elected officials or, you know, community representatives that everybody knows about. But there needs to be a lot more communication and transparency of all scales between those sorts of new corporate owners or the more traditional owners and breaking down of social hierarchies as well in rural Scotland. Feudalism, unfortunately, uh, still very much exists. And that's both a cultural and a kind of mindset change and some people feel quite worried and reluctant to kind of step away from it so we need to make it you know accessible and uh, uh, and a way that young people expect that the way that decisions are made I think going forward okay. um, radical sometimes as as uh, the definition is something that happens really quickly radical change doesn't need to take place overnight and and I th we have seen changes with and, and you know there's examples of Buclew and, and and Langham and whatever and in my constituency we, we, we see public ownership of the Muller Galloway and so on are we getting there does radical necessarily mean it needs to be really really quick or does it actually take a long time to deliver radical change Andrew you, you've been at the coalface for quite some time wearing different hats 
So if you give us what your radical policy would be, and uh, does radical mean that it needs to happen really quickly, or is it a, a slow transition to make sure radical change actually delivers what people expect it to? Uh, can, can I, yeah, so let me make two or three points. I will answer that. The, the first is that I think, I think what you said, you were speaking for a lot of the Scottish people when you said what you said. And I think that's very important, because if the, if the Scottish people... Uh, get frustrated by this, I think that's, that's actually dangerous. Um, I think that will produce political demand for change which may not have been properly thought through and might actually be unwise. So I think Parliament absolutely needs to be listening to what you've said. Let me just say that first of all. Um, and, I, and I think from the point... I'm not going to tell you what I think about radical. What I'll tell you is that what people tell me is, and a lot of people tell me is, it is not radical enough for their taste, for their point of view. Um, so I think that's... Politically, that's actually a very important thing. Um, the problem... I'm, I'm now going to defend the Parliament. The Parliament... Property rights are really important. They underpin our economic model. Um, if you're not confident in your property rights, you won't invest in your property, and if you don't invest in your property, then our whole economic model falls apart. So property rights are enshrined in the Human Rights Act uh, and the European Convention of Human Rights above that. And Parliament finds that intensely frustrating and difficult and has already fallen foul of it once already and got into serious trouble over limited partnerships with tenant farmers, which cost the taxpayer a great deal in, in, in compensation and so on. So it's not, you know, the Parliament's already made one mistake. So I, I think we have to be pretty sympathetic to to people like Finlay, he's got a very difficult job to do to, to find a way through that, to satisfy on the one hand what is undoubtedly a significant level of impatience amongst Scottish voters and on the other hand a, a very difficult framework to work, to work within. So I'm not excusing it but I think we have to be understanding uh, uh, about that. What do I think realistically we could do and should do? Um, I, I think there are two linked things, they're really just one. I think the public interest test, which is proposed for, and I believe will come through from the consultation, is proposed for the next bill. I think the public interest test is a, potentially a massive step forward if we get that right, because it is going to create a framework for testing the question, at what point do property rights and the public interest come into balance? It is right to protect property rights, but not at any cost. And when do they come into balance? So if it's well-framed and it's robust, I think it will ask and provide a mechanism for answering that question really well. I think that's enormously important because I do think that, that the, the, the very highly concentrated pattern of ownership we've got compared with anywhere else in Europe is highly unlikely to be the best model, <laughs> given what everyone else is doing. Um, so, so I think that happens. And linked to that, I want to take your crofting point because I, you know, I'm, I've just joined the board of the crofting commission, and people said to me, "What on earth are you doing that for?" Um, and the reason is that actually, I think we need in this country going forward a really effective regulated system of small, small-scale land tenure, whatever that is. And crofting. Um, that's what crofting was created for. Crofting only exists in the crofting counties. It's frankly um, uh, arcane and archaic now, and it's not working, and the crofting commission's up its own backside trying to make it work. So we need to radically rethink that. But if we had in this country a, a completely new system of regulated small-scale land tenure that applied to the entirety of Scotland and was linked to the question of the public interest test on large-scale land tenure. So, so one, of the, one of the questions would be, well, this is pretty big, but if you stick some of it into small-scale regulated land tenure, then maybe you could retain the ownership, there may be ways around it. If you put those two things together, those two things, I think, would be enough for the next five years, and then, then we'll have another land reform bill. Mm -hmm. OK, I've, I've got one of the most difficult jobs now tonight. I, there's two people who have had their hand up for a while I really want to bring in, so but I will shut you down if your question is not very, very short. Uh, and I'll also uh, shut down those in the platform if it's too short. So the gentleman in the back there with their, their hand up, if you could just ask your question very briefly, and we'll, we'll come to the gentleman at the front here and ask the question. 
Uh, yes, cheers. So, a uh, similar vein to previous questions, uh, but I was mainly interested in what expect, uh, change can we actually expect from the planning system itself? Uh, as mentioned, it's obviously a lot more market-led than it is people or community-led or plan-led. Uh, also, massively stacked against communities, uh, developers who hold this huge amount of land and power get an instant right of appeal against any decision they disagree with. Communities, communities yeah. don't get that. Is that is a right. massive question. It's a fantastic question. We should probably have come to that before. Thank you for that. And then the gentleman here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Very much uh, interesting and enjoyable. Um, I'm slightly surprised we've got to this point on uh, August the 10th without any reference at all to grouse shooting, which will ingloriously start uh, on Saturday, or not start, because there won't be a lot of it. And actually, that's the basis of my question, really. It's about public interest and when private interest isn't concerned with profit, because it seems to me that grouse shooting loses money year after year. Just occasionally it might make a bit of money, but meanwhile, nature is losing. We're doing bad things with carbon, and communities, uh, contrary, I think, to some of the things Andrew said, are not as able as they should be. They're hollowed out. They can't really exercise the kind of... So my question sorry, is about pace of change. It's going back to pace of change. That has to change. How is it going to happen faster than it is currently happening, even although the business is bust? OK, I'm, I'm going to start at the end of the... the to give you a wee idea, my committee is dealing with the, the Grouse Moor uh, and uh, a wildlife bill right now. We're also going to have an agriculture bill. We've also got a new biodiversity plan. We've got the climate change plan that's going to be reviewed. We've got the land reform. Uh, unfortunately, um, we don't have a lot of parliamentarians to scrutinise the legislation, so that there is a, a natural slowness, unfortunately. But there is, there's also a, a desire by politicians to, to get these pieces of legislation in place. But it's a very busy landscape at the moment. But I'm going to start with Stephen. Maybe you want to touch on... Uh, well, if you could briefly answer both questions. Go, uh, Speed of change and a uh, planning. Yeah, you've got a natural environment bill coming next yes. year as well, which will cover a lot of these things. Um, speed of change. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of two questions. I was, I was thinking around grouse shooting. I mean, grouse shooting does deliver a lot for the for the economy. It does deliver. There's clear evidence that biodiversity on managed moors is, is greater than an unmanaged moors. You can refute evidence if you want, but that's what it, is. it does create a lot of employment. It does create a lot of benefits through rural areas. So we have to think about. It's back to this green jobs thing. If we're creating change, what's going to build on what's already there? What's going to create more jobs? What's going to help biodiversity? Rather than just taking something we don't like and removing it, because it'll be delivering in different ways. So it, I, I, would, I would disagree with your, your statement there. Planning, planning's, planning's planning. It's totally unwieldy, really difficult. No matter who you are, it's a bit of a nightmare. I can't, I, sorry, I can't answer in a short way. It's a nightmare. <laughs> Annie, I'm quite sure in Aberdeenshire that the, the local authority planning department is equally under massive pressure and under-resourced as every other, particularly rural um, planning department in Scotland. I'm sure, I'm sure they are. I've never really engaged with the planning system, or certainly not in Aberdeenshire. Um, I think, again, it's about giving space to communities to engage with that. So having local place plans that are then integrated with the local development plan, I think that's really fundamental. And there are some really good examples where resource has been put heavily into a community to spend the time to have the reflection and integrating local officials as well so they, they get to hear that voice. So I think it's a call to everyone to take part. If you're here tonight and you're interested, then go and attend those sorts of meetings that don't sound very interesting because they will be important in the end. Um, grouse shooting is an absolute minefield. Um, I think I completely agree with you, Stephen, about what do we mean by green jobs. That's something the government is very interested in finding out from our research is are the new types of land uses that we're seeing in the uplands, are they green jobs? Are they actually contributing to a new economy, a green economy? Um, and I think that there is potential for it to be very productive, actually, new types of land use. Um, but it's going to take some time. So that's part of your pace of change. You know, people who are, are skilled at peatland restoration are not quite there yet. And they're maybe still at school. And we need, we, we need to fast track them into that. So, yeah, I think there's a, a bit of work to be done on encouraging, creating and innovating in what we mean by, you know, green jobs and what we want the uplands to be for. 
I'm not going to repeat myself, but I completely agree with you. Pub there needs to be much stronger public, in uh, public interest leadership in the planning system. If you go to almost any other developed country in Europe, you'll see a completely different model that does exactly that. We're way behind the curve, so I agree with you on that. On, on the Grousemore point, built into the Land Reform Bill, I think, and certainly built into the consultation, is the concept of much, much tighter uh, regulation of the way in which land is used in, in these bigger holdings where there is a significant level of monopoly power. Now, if that comes through, and it will depend on parliamentarians, not on me, but if that comes through, then I think the Scottish voters will start to feel that we are getting a grip on this, that the public interest is getting a bigger say in it all, and, and, the, uh, the, uh, and the pace and momentum are building. Um, but, you know, the process, the bill's not published yet, we don't know what, what, what it'll look like. It, 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 it's going to be a difficult one for parliamentarians. They've got to balance on the one hand, as I keep emphasising, this is a property-owning democracy, the Human, Rights, uh, the Human Rights Act, and there are good reasons for that. They've got to balance that with, on the other hand, the very legitimate right to intervene in property rights where there is a public interest case for doing so. And we've got to get that right. And we're not getting it right at the moment. Well, folks, uh, thank you very much for your contributions to this event. But before we close, uh, I'm going to give each of the panellists a few sentences. I was going to give them a minute, but we are way over time. But a few sentences to deflect on what they believe the key points are from the discussions tonight. So I'll start with you, Andrew, Annie, and then Stephen. Please engage with the process of the Land Reform Bill as it goes forward. Annie. Uh, I think it's possibly going back to Jen's point about how integrated this all is, and that's a challenge for the government having all of these different pieces of legislation coming through. But it is, you know, back to the fact that land is the kind of basis for all of these sorts of discussions. You can't get away from that. Thank you. And Stephen. Yeah, I agree. I think land is, is crucial to all this. We've got to integrate policies, integrate thinking, legislation. Um, and I think that kind of uh, communication on both sides is, is really important. And this demonising people for who they are, not what they do, is, is not helpful on, uh, in any sphere. So greater communication um, would be all for that. Thank you. Well, we must end it there. And I'd like to thank you all for coming along today and taking part in the debate. And I'd also like to thank our panellists, Andrew Thin, Annie McKee and Stephen Young for their insightful uh, views on the discussion. As, as convener of the, the Rural Affairs Committee, I can assure you that this I item and land reform will remain a key priority for the Scottish Parliament over the coming years. And with that in mind, I'd like to thank uh, the Parliament's Future, uh, Future Forum for the support in putting the event together uh, today. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to remind you that there are more festival events taking place tomorrow, including Scotland's poverty problem, uh, where are the ethics and AI and aviation and sustainability to fly or not to fly, to name a few. But I hope you'll be able to enjoy enjoy uh, those other events and thank you very much for your participation tonight. Thank you.